It's my pleasure to uh, introduce uh, a friend, colleague, alum, uh, Dr. Raghavendra Rao, as you all know. <laughs> Since you applaud it, let me take the honor. Formally. Thank you. <laughs> um, as you all know from the flyer that went out, Raghu is the Sir Evelyn D. Rothschild Chair of Finance at the Judge Business School at Cambridge. Uh, Raghu's uh, accomplishments are long, so bear with me as I list them. He has been president of the European Finance Association. He is the founder and director of the Cambridge Center for Alternative Finance. He's a member of the Cambridge Corporate Governance Network. Raghu's interests are broad. He has taught at Purdue, at UCLA, <coughs> at Berkeley, at Paris Dauphin. Uh, he has had editorships at some of our better journals, financial management, uh, associate editorships at Journal of Banking and Finance, financial research, published in all of the top journals, uh, management science, Journal of Finance, JFE, Accounting Research, Journal of Accounting, Accounting Review, Journal of Accounting Research, JFQA, you name it. He has won multiple awards for best papers. I won't even go into all of them. He has won multiple awards for teaching as well. Um, Raghu's interests, like I said, were broad. He's, these days, he's Mr. Fintech planet-wide, but to, to, to sort of put Fintech <coughs> in its um, place, it's really about how firms and investors are acquiring and using information. So it's a pleasure to welcome Raghu here to our class on campus. Uh, I think he will go for about an hour and a quarter or thereabouts, and then we'll be free to take questions. And there is, I think, tea and biscuits offset. Thank you very much for that really nice introduction, Badri. Uh, and thank you all for coming on the 31st of the year. I mean, you now, as, as Badri pointed out, I used to be an alum here, and I don't think that any of us would have come in on the last day of the year for a talk by some random guy coming from somewhere, right? So I'm very impressed that standards have improved tremendously from when I was here. <laughs> <clears throat> anyway, uh, as uh, my, uh, uh, most people call me Raghu, and one of the reasons I want to emphasize that, it's kind of obvious, right? Raghumendra, the short form is Raghu, but one of the reasons I want to emphasize that is because today we're going to be talking a little bit about disruption through technology. And when I talk about disruption to technology, I also point out that the reason I call myself Raghu is because even Google has problems with the word Raghavendra. Right. So for example, in the US, when I was there last year, I have a Google Voice phone number, so people would leave messages, and this is how Google translates my name. Right. It says, hello, this is Robert Green. I'm calling from National Market Research Firm. We would like to speak with the Avenger. <laughs> I'm totally fine being called the Avenger, right? But, but you can see that, you know, Raghu is something that, Raghu also, Google has problems with, right? Sometimes it thinks about these kind of Raghus, so, which is also okay. But human beings have problems as well. It's not just, it's not just machines which have problems with my name. I have also been mistaken for this person over here sometimes. <laughs> so there's a conference where I was... <laughs> No, it's, it's, some gentleman has, in fact, asked me if I was Ben Bernanke because I was giving a talk at an economics conference. But for those of you who like football, I've also been mistaken for this gentleman. <laughs> right, he's the manager of the Manchester City football team. Right? So I'm unfortunately this rather boring person at the bottom. So <clears throat> Buddy points out, I started out with an undergraduate degree in chemistry in Delhi a long time ago, did my PGDM in IM Bangalore, in 1987, 89. Um, <laughs> yeah. I uh, worked for a couple of years, decided I didn't quite like working for business, so I decided when you don't like doing, you don't like, you know, you're not very good at doing something, you teach it, right? So, which is why I decided to do a PhD in finance at INSEAD. So my two years, which convinced me I was not fit out, cut out for business, was I was working with CMC, posted with Indian Oil, which was you know, a public sector firm. So it's like every public sector firm, it's a very difficult job, right? You wake up at 11 o'clock, you go for work. At about noon, you take a lunch break, and then you go home at 2 o'clock, right? <laughs> it's, 
<clears throat> it's a difficult job to do, but I was very happy not doing it. But anyway, two years of that was more than enough for me. And so I became a professor. But before that, I was principal at Barclays Global Investors in San Francisco in 2008, 2009. And then I ended up at Cambridge in about 2011. Now, why is that interesting? It's because uh, when you look at the stock market over that entire period of time I was there, this was 2008, 2010, that was the day I arrived at BGI. Literally, the day I arrived, the markets collapsed. <laughs> You would say, hey, this is a coincidence, right? I mean, you know, I arrived, the market collapses. Yes, Lemon also went bankrupt. All of those things happened the same week. And I would say, yes, I agree with you. This is a coincidence, except that's the week I decided to become a professor again. <laughs> so all in all, this was, this was a very powerful expression of how influential I am in the financial markets. <laughs> I showed this graph to some friends of mine at Cambridge, and then they said, yes, you moved to Cambridge, and all the European crisis happened after that, right? The Greek problem, Brexit, all of that happened after here. Then I came here to Bangalore, and the RBI governor resigned, right? So <laughs> nothing to do with me, obviously, but it's just coincidental. Anyway, I also got the Ig Nobel Prize in Management in 2015, and this was one of my proudest achievements. You guys heard of the Ig Nobel? Right? If you haven't, it's the opposite of the Nobel. Right? So it's basically research that makes people burst out laughing when they see, what the hell is this guy writing about? And then they figure out there's actually something in it. So that was me getting the award. But the interesting thing about the award is the way they manage technology. So for example, it's incredibly expensive to have spotlights over the speakers at all times. So these guys hire a person who walks around behind you, she's called the human flashlight, costs you $15 an hour, but you have a permanent flashlight over your head. The most interesting thing about this particular one is that you can give an acceptance speech for this one, but the acceptance speech can be no longer than one minute long. Right? And this is really difficult to enforce because a professors like talking, right? It's very difficult to shut these people up. The definition of a professor is somebody who talks in other people's sleep. Right? <laughs> We all know this. So how do you shut up somebody after exactly one minute? Right? What do you think? You turn off the flashlight is obvious. No, they do something smarter. They get a little eight-year-old girl. Her name is Miss Sweetie Pooh. She comes up to you after exactly one minute is up. She stands, looks you in the face, and says, please stop. You're so boring. <laughs> and she keeps saying that until you stop talking. Right? So very effective. But now you know over the next course of the hour, if you, at any point in time you feel really bored about all this stuff, just let me know. I'm, I know exactly what to do. Okay? The good thing about the award is it made me independently wealthy. Because the award for this is $100 trillion. You guys seen that, right? You know what it looks like. This is what it looks like. <laughs> it's about $5 in US currency. right? So yeah, I have that framed. It's unfortunately not as wealthy as I thought I would be. Okay. Anyway, so I'm also director of something called the Cambridge Center for Alternative Finance. And the reason I call it the Cambridge Center for Alternative Finance is because I don't really have to define alternative finance. Nobody really knows what alternative is. right? So I can pretty much do whatever I want without actually having to restrain myself to something. So what was that about? Well, we're looking at new types of financial instruments, channels, or systems that emerge outside the traditional financial models, right? So for example, we're looking at these types of new types of channels. We're looking at new types of data being used to analyze those channels, different types of payment systems, blockchains, cryptocurrencies, things like that. And finally, understanding how regulators are responding to all these new financial developments. So uh, we have a bunch of benchmarking studies which are available on our website. I'll talk about that towards the end. So we have data on pretty much every country in the world to sort of figure out what are these types of business models which are rising everywhere. Um, and all the models are available, all the uh, data is available free on our website. They're also going to be part of the World Bank data series in 2019. So you can also get all the data which I'm going to talk about straight from our website over there. All right. So Trying to put everything we do into a frame. Right? So the basic question we are trying to address at the center is very straightforward, which is, what's the best way to coordinate on some activity or the other? At the end of the day, we want to figure out how do we do something together. There are two traditional responses to this. Right? Response number one is we do this through a market. 
I hire you to do something, you do something, and then we walk away. The second approach is coordinating through a firm, where you basically have a sort of relationship which persists over a period of time. The question is, which is better? Is it better to coordinate through a market or coordinate through a firm? And we have to deal with three problems. The first problem is imperfect information. We don't have enough information. So how do we get the right amount of information we need to address the problems we're going to talk about? The second one is asymmetric information. That is, I have less information than the person on the other side of the deal. And finally, we have behavioral biases, which means even if you do have the information, you have no way of understanding what to do with the information that you do have. Right? What I'm going to talk about today is how technology is changing the process of dealing with these three problems. Okay? So, with three developments in particular, we're going to talk about artificial intelligence, we're going to talk about automation, and we're going to talk about blockchains and see how that is changing the way we deal with these five, three types of issues. All right, so going back now, we're going through a market or through a hierarchy. What's the difference between the two? Well, the first one is, the key difference is a market is a voluntary exchange. That means you can choose to participate in the market or not. You choose not to participate, that's your prerogative. You don't have to participate, right? You don't have to sell your things or buy something. You don't want to walk away. <clears throat> but there, the, everything is being driven through prices. So prices are acting as a coordinating mechanism for people between um, each other in a financial market. In contrast, in a firm, it's a, partly done at least by command. In other words, you can't walk into a firm, say, hey, I'm not in the mood to work today, unless you're working for a public sector firm, right? You can't say, I'm not in the mood to work today, and I'm going to come back tomorrow, and you split for the day. If you try to do that in a private sector firm, you're likely to be fired. So there are certain decision makers who have broad legal rights who they determine exactly uh, how the resources are going to be used within that organization. They set the goal for that particular organization. Okay? Now, there are alternative ways. Uh, both, some are good in some directions. In other cases, you have markets or you have firms. So you cannot say the markets are unambiguously good or firms are unambiguously good. OK, so why do we choose markets over hierarchies or vice versa? The answer to that goes back to the 1930s. Right? The basic story is very straightforward. It's transaction costs. And this was John Commons in 1931 basically said, all types of engagement between human beings is done through transactions. So that's what we need to study in order to figure out how to coordinate activities. Then Ronald Coase in 1937, you got a Nobel Prize for that. Set, set a theoretical framework to say when should something be handled through a firm or when should it be handled through the market. And Oliver Williamson did this in 1975. He got a Nobel Prize for it as well. Basically said the five determinants of transaction costs, which is the frequency with which you carry out a transaction, how specific are the assets you need to commit to that particular transaction, uh, uncertainty, limited rationality, and the opportunistic behavior which people might choose to engage in. Right? All of these, they're very high, then you might want to put something within a firm as opposed to through a market. So the choice between firm and market depends on multiple dimensions. So what are the problems you must solve if you're within a company? The first problem is straightforward. It's the assignment problem. Right? Somebody has to decide. So who is the person who gets to decide? Why does a CEO be the person who chooses the role for an organization? Why can it not be maybe the bottom people who may have more information, but maybe that information is not firm specific? Right? So that's the first question, the decision rights. Who gets the decision rights? The second question is incentive problem. That means once you have decided who gets to decide and when they get to decide, you need to figure out how do you compensate the people to best achieve the entire goals set by the people in the assignment issue here. Then finally, you got the performance evaluation problem. Once these people have actually delivered, how do you monitor the amount of effort they put in? And how do you compensate them for the amount of effort they've actually put in? Right? So these are the three big issues which we have. And we're going to argue that technology is changing the ways we approach all these, these three different problems. So, First question is, 
we go back to our three issues, we had imperfect information, asymmetric information, and behavioral biases. If you think about the first one, imperfect information, that would say, let's have more information, and that solves the imperfect information problem. Is that true? Is it true that increased information flow is better? Right? Regulators tell you, yes, it's always better, because it reduces asymmetric information and imperfect information. That means, in other words, I give you more information, it levels the playing field between the buyers and the sellers. For example, if you are selling your car, you have to, you have to inform the buyers of any major accidents a car has been involved in. That's classic information asymmetry. Similarly, if you're listed on the stock market, you've got to file quarterly financial reports. If you have a bank or investment fund, you've got to comply with all these reporting requirements which you have. If you are operating in certain sectors like pharmaceuticals, healthcare, and so on, you have to give additional information to both regulators and the public. So this would say getting as much information as possible is good. The problem is getting as much information as possible also increases behavioral problems. For example, <clears throat> one of the biggest assumptions in economics is we are rational people. We do stuff because we have carefully thought through the alternatives, and that's why we do things, right? So for example, an economist can't see what's going on in your head. They can only see what you're actually doing. And on the basis of that, they infer what you were thinking. So what does that mean? Suppose you're offered both apples and bananas at the same price, and you choose the banana. What does the economist infer? You prefer bananas to apples. Right? Pretty straightforward. So I don't know that you actually prefer bananas to apples. I just infer it based on what the choice was and based on the fact that the price was the same. Okay? Seems rational, except we tend to make a lot of bad decisions. For example, if you shop for groceries, you buy more when the shopping carts are bigger. Right? Or we buy more cheese than we actually need after somebody offers us a bite of cheese standing at the front of the... You know, you're like, hmm, this tastes pretty good. And then you feel bad. Oh, my God, they're trying to sell this. Okay, let's just pick up one and put it in our bag, right? Or when you're standing at the checkout line, you buy the candy, you buy the gum, right? Because they're right next to the exit. You're wait, waiting for something. I'm like, okay, let's reach out and grab something. It's not you're actually thinking through any rational decisions at that time. You might say, you know, these are small examples, right? But this has actually been shown to be pretty interesting. And my favorite example is the bottomless soup bowl. The guy who came up with this idea was actually got an Ig Nobel Prize for this as well. What he did was to connect two soup bowls and one soup bowl with a pipe under it, which went to a giant pot on the other side. So as you would eat soup, the soup bowl would miraculously keep refilling without you actually realizing that there was a lot more soup in it than was by the size of the bowl. It turns out they Half the participants ate from the normal soup bowls. The other half ate from bowls that were rigged in a way they could be refilled. These guys ate 73% more soup. And more interestingly, they had no idea that they had done that. Right? It turns out that you know, we basically rely on our eyes and that. So like, okay, it's not that I feel full. People have said, okay, how do you know when you've eaten? Um, I feel full. That's why I stopped eating. Right? It wasn't this. It's like, my plate is empty. That's why I know I've eaten enough. And the plate here was never getting empty, so they keep eating until they had nearly double what the other people were eating. That kind of throws a bit of a difference between the idea of rational behavior and behavioral finance in some way. Right? So second problem with this is too much information. First, behavioral biases. The second is too many choices. So for example, you prefer bananas over apples. We just talked about that. But you also prefer organic over regular, ripe over green. So now you have to choose between green conventional bananas, but ripe organic apples. How do you go with that? Right? At the end of the day, what I would see you do is buy something. But how did you weight all the different things in your head before you came up with that final choice? This is really difficult to do. Right? You have to weight them according to the important what type of fruit, how it is ripened, where it was grown, what is sugar content, what's the nutritional value, what's the shelf life. You're making a complex series of decisions. And the more information there is, the more difficult it is to actually make that choice. So 
the other choices, what hotel to book for your annual vacation, what car to purchase, what house to get, all of these are multiple dimensions. And of course, sellers make this really hard to choose because they give everything in non-standard terms, so you can't even compare very much what this item is with that item. They're both classified completely differently. Right? So, and except when it comes to recognizing visual patterns, we are terrible at figuring out huge amounts of information. In fact, there was a paper in 1956 which is called the Magical Number 7, which said that we cannot process more than six, maximum seven pieces of information at one point in time. More than seven, we stop thinking about it, right? And it finds that's true for a whole bunch of different things. Tastes, tones, colors, points. We cannot make out the difference between six, maximum seven. That's why when you think about the number of colors in the rainbow, we can only distinguish actually seven colors. And pretty true for most of the things you think about. Okay, so what we do then is say, okay, let's condense everything into a simpler number which you can understand. And the simpler number is price, right? So price is, which tells us it's sort of an aggregate of all these different streams of information coming in and somehow being condensed into something which you can now say, we prefer this because it is lower price or better value than something else. But that doesn't solve our problems either because marketers take advantage of that as well. For example, prices ending in nines. We see this all the time, right? 10,999 rupees and things like that. But actually, this can be, even if you're aware of that, people can take advantage of you in different ways. My favorite example was Steve Jobs and the iPad. So when the iPad came in, how do you price the iPad? It's a product which nobody's ever seen before. I mean, it's, it's a big item compared to a phone. No one's ever had the need for something like this. It's a brand new item. How do you price it? So what Steve Jobs did was kind of straightforward. He basically put this picture of an iPad up there and he said, well, you know, we were wondering about how to price it and then we asked all our engineers and we asked our customer, customer specialists and we asked all our marketers, how do we price this thing? And they said, given the amount of stuff that's gone in there, we would, should price it at $999. And of course, 999 is code for 1,000 because, you know, everyone, marketers expect you to be fooled by the fact that it's 999 and not 1,000. And of course, everybody would laugh, right? Because you say, okay, yes, everybody else may be fooled, but we are smart enough, we can figure this out. Anyway, he said, but we decided we want to make that iPad, which is something you guys would like to buy. I mean, 999 is okay, but we're not going to sell it to you at 999. It's a big number pops up there, 999. He wipes that clean. He says... People said, okay, what about $7.99? said, no, that's even too high. What we're going to offer it to you is $499. So when you look at that, you're like, wait a minute. What are you comparing it to? The key point was it's a different bias. It's not the $9.99 is less than 1,000 bias. It's a bias of anchoring. You suddenly got $9.99 in your head, and then you say, whoa, this is less than half the price I thought it should be worth. This is cheap. Let's buy this stuff, right? Or let's take about... This in particular. So you have New York City, known to a $175 hamburger. Who buys this? A few Wall Street Journal people buy it after they get the annual bonuses, but nobody else, right? The most of the other people, they look at that price and say, everything else looks really cheap on the menu, including the $90 steak. <clears throat> so that's one example. Another example in China. It turns out the number eight in China sounds like good fortune and wealth and all these things, uh, while well, the number four sounds like debt. So companies going public in China go public at eight, dollars, uh, eight yuan 88. They never go public at 4.44, though, of course, two shares at 4.44 is one share at 8.88. It's the same thing, but you will never find a company going public at 4.44 ever in China. But there's a huge chunk which goes at 8.88. All right, so what do we need today? To figure out what we need to do is we need three things. First of all, we need to be able to figure out our preferences across multiple dimensions. So we need a language for that. Second thing, we need to match our preferences along those multiple dimensions. We don't want to condense it to one price, one number, because that just aggregates too much information into one little thing. Third thing, we need a way to capture all those preferences and then make a choice among all these different preference streams we have. 
Right? So these are the three problems which I'm going to try to solve using technology. So first one, standard language. This is not commonly appreciated. Nobody talks about it that much. But it's one of the most important problems we have today in technological disruption. Right? Let's talk about that. Let's say you want to buy a pair of shoes. Right? If you go to the US and you go to a website like Zappos, this is what it kind of looks like. Right? There's not just sneakers of that type there, but there are a huge number of dimensions on which you can choose. You can choose whether, and this is just, by the way, I picked in this particular example um, male sneakers because if you go with female, there are like 400 additional dimensions you can choose for. But anyway, so the categories would be lifestyle, athletic shoes, running shoes, um, Climbing shoes, cleats, work and safety sneakers, down shoes. You pick those, then you can pick the brand, you can pick the price, you can pick the color, you can pick the width, you can pick the size. There's a huge number of dimensions which you have. Now, the first question, of course, is how can these guys provide you with that much information about the shoes? In some cases, you look at that and like, I can't make up my mind. There's so many dimensions here. Well, first of all, what Zappos does is labels each product with data that just describes the shoe's characteristics. That means, unfortunately, you have to have all the products of a particular kind using the same set of categories. Right? So it's a consistent standard set of categories. But those categories are also data, but they're data about the data which is in the items you're buying, so they're metadata. Okay? And that's very important. Without that, you cannot find anything online. Without to give you an example of exactly that. So in the old days, even Zappos is pretty straightforward to do because everything is very nicely laid out, right? So you would say, I want, for example, sneakers. It'll pull it out of that field, all the products which are from that field alone, which is OK to do. But what about emails, web pages, images, audio, and video files, right? Classic example, YouTube, where you have uploaders who are transacting with viewers financed by my advertisers. So if you're trying to depend on keywords to try to figure out what's going on, what well, the problem is, the problem is, number one, the viewers need to be able to find the content they want quickly. So the content providers need to find and make their content discoverable. So if you depend on the title of a video or the date of a time of upload, it may not tell you what the video is all about. If you add labels or keywords to the video, it works only if the uploader picks the right keywords. If they pick a non-standard set of keywords, they just misspell the keyword, you got something completely wrong. But if you look at the way you search for things on, on YouTube, it's amazingly accurate many, much of the time. In contrast, if you look at ESPN, most of, the peop most of the time when you go to ESPN, you're not interested in watching a whole game. You're interested in watching just the highlights of the game. Say the test match, India versus Australia, uh, you won't necessarily want to watch the whole five days of the game. You just want to say, OK, let's see the, pick, the key events in those five days. How does ESPN do it? It actually hires human beings who sit down, watch the entire video in real time, and tag items appropriately so that you can jump to wherever you want to. But that won't work with YouTube because it's just too big. Right? You can't have human beings monitoring everything there is in YouTube, which creates a lot of problems with YouTube search videos, by the way. But anyway, we'll come back to that. But that means there are two types of marketplaces. First one is specialized platforms, relatively easy, like washing machines, TVs, hard drives, whatever, because the categories are given to you. Right? So it's very straightforward. The ontology is obvious. But general marketplace is much more difficult, right? How do you search for a concept? Like, I want to do a somersault. You can type in somersault into YouTube. It will show you a bunch of videos of people doing that. But it's a concept. It's not quite a product, right? There are no items to decide on that. So let's take eBay versus Amazon in the same way. Turns out when eBay was to do it, you'd have to hunt for words in the product titles and the descriptions, but you have to scroll through pages and pages of the results. It made the discoverability of items on eBay about 40%. 60% of the time, you would not be able to find what you're looking for. In contrast with Amazon, you can pretty much find what you're looking for. But notice the difference. Why was there a difference between the two? What did Amazon start with? What are the first product they sold? Books, right? OK, but why books? There is a classification system there already. 
right, the Dewey Decimal Classification System, you don't actually have to reinvent a classification system because all books are very easy to classify. So there, if you look at Amazon, it's much easier now, once you start with a classification system, to add things to that classification system than basically make up one from scratch. So what is eBay doing now is basically looking at data ontology, is trying to figure out exactly how to find things on eBay. So they're working uh, to improve their cataloging for discovery is 42%, they want to get to 90%, and what they're looking for is startups like Alation, Corrigan, Expert Maker, their job is to find metadata for you. That means, in other words, you don't even know how to classify your data. You want to find data which describes your data without knowing what the data is. This is really complicated to do, right? So as a career, from a career's perspective, this is a really hot area for jobs, but we don't really talk about it that much, right? We have uh, very few courses on data ontology, um, but for those of you who are interested, this is a very hot area coming forward. Okay. So that's element one. Element two is matching. So suppose somehow you put all the stuff you need into a bunch of categories so you really know you can find things. But now I need to figure out, okay, how do I match on those different categories? So in other words, what do I really want? I have so many preferences. What do I want? Right? So the richer the information, the more difficult it is going to be to process it. So we need to figure out, you know, how do you search for an airline flight? Ease my trip, Expedia, Hipmunk, all these websites give you a whole bunch of different ways to hunt for things or find a place to stay on Airbnb, right? Multiple dimensions, how do you choose the matching point here? This is information overload, right? And if you feel that when you're hunting for things on the web, yeah, we feel, a lot of us feel this all the time, right? Even when you walk into a supermarket, we sometimes feel information overload, like 300 types of toothpaste. Why would I care about all those pieces? You're like, just pick one and get on with it, right? Okay, so, that, so now we need to figure out, can we actually stream on multiple preferences? Because at the moment, all the preference matching is with one thing. We're looking at price. But we shouldn't match necessarily on price. We should try to match on all the things we want to match on. For example, organic versus conventional, green versus right. You know, these different preference streams, but each of them is a different stream. The thing is, we already can do this because that data there is just another pattern in data. Think about Google Photos. When you guys do Google Photos, Google Photos will give you a list of things saying, this is where you were. I saw this yesterday, some assistant, uh, Google Photos gave me an assistant feature who said, 10 years ago versus now. And I didn't look like this 10 years ago. Right? I didn't have a beard, I didn't have a mustache, I looked completely different. But Google somehow recognized me from 10 years ago, stuck this next to me and said, this is what you were doing 10 years ago. And I was like, man, I shouldn't have put so many photos on Google Photos. But that's the key there. The same idea about Siri and Alexa understanding your voice commands or you know, your smart watches. If you have basically a heart arrhythmia, it should detect that and call the um, ambulance for you right away. Right? That's just another preference stream using that same technology. And that is possible now is getting another multiple data streams and then having a pattern matching algorithm to get us the optimal transaction partner we want. Okay? So there are a bunch of papers which talk about this as well. But this is the exact procedure which is being used by a whole bunch of companies, Spotify, Apple Music, Amazon products, and so on. The earliest example of this was Netflix. So if you remember, in the old days, well, before I uh, think when Netflix still had the DVD uh, you know, by mail, that doesn't have that much anymore. But they would actually, even today, you watch something on Netflix that says, if you like this, we recommend this. There's a 90% chance you're going to like this. This is crucial for Netflix, getting those numbers right. Why? Because suppose you watch Netflix, and then you check Netflix recommends this movie to you, and you don't like it. Are you going to go back and watch more recommendations by Netflix? Maybe you'll even cancel your Netflix subscription. So the key is, how do I, Netflix has to get that exactly so that you will go, you will only stay with Netflix. You watch whatever they're telling you to watch because you know that Netflix knows what you like. That's their ideal goal, right? If it says there's a 100% chance you'll like this, you will stay and watch that and you will like it. And so you keep paying Netflix your monthly subscription. Okay, so 
Netflix in 1986 had a problem. Their recommendation algorithms were getting about a 70% accuracy rate. So what they did was to launch a Netflix prize competition. The Netflix prize, they said, was we'll take all our data, we'll anonymize it, we'll take out the names of people, we'll take out their addresses, but we'll make that data available to anybody who wants to do it. So what your job is to say, what the, and you know what people liked, right? So you can say, based on your, you know what the age of the people is, you know their gender, you know approximately where they live, you know all these things. Can you predict, can you improve the accuracy of the pricing algorithm from that 60% number which they had. And people, you know, it is an open challenge, and uh, challenges like this are launched all the time these days, by the way. So these guys, a huge number of people did this. It's a million dollar contest, right? And when everything worked perfectly up to about 82%. They got to an 82% accuracy rate, and they couldn't get beyond 82%. Why not? Well, actually, the answer is actually pretty straightforward. It turns out there was one movie called Napoleon Dynamite, which basically screwed up everything. So what was Napoleon Dynamite about? If you have any of you seen that in the audience? OK, there's one hand going up over there. Did you like it? OK. So the problem with that is Napoleon Dynamite was a movie which is very difficult to predict. People who liked action movies like Napoleon Dynamite. People who like romantic comedies like Napoleon Dynamite. You put Napoleon Dynamite in there, it screws up your results. You take Napoleon Dynamite out, the recommendation accuracy goes to 90%. So that one movie was basically screwing up all the algorithms. I'll show you another example in a few minutes with Google Photos, which has exactly the same problem. We'll come back to that. Right? And this part of the problem is the training data sets we use. But that was a Napoleon Dynamite problem. The last element is that of our preferences, right? We need to understand, basically, um, we have all these choices. We have told the system what we want. We want all these different preference streams, and they're being captured by the system there. But now the system has to say, OK, based on your preferences, not just price, based on all your preferences, I think you're going to like this. Okay? So that means the computer has to understand what you like or what you don't like. So how does the computer do that? Right? So you need huge volumes of data. That's one of the reasons you read all the newspaper articles today saying that China is going way ahead of the US in the artificial intelligence race because they have all those huge volumes of data. Uh, this, for example, Google, I'll give you more examples of Google in a minute. They use all text from the web to get the probability patterns of word usage for the language Google Translate. You need frequent feedback from the system, so you need to, system to self-adjust based on the circumstances which change over time. Right? OK, so most of these models are based on psychometrics. The idea that we can predict what you're like based on what you tell me you do. I'll give you an example of this. So for example, this would be a typical psychometric test. Some of you may have taken this already. Right? It says, which celebrity do you prefer? You got Tom Cruise or Frank Sinatra? So some people might say A, some people might say B, whatever. Similarly, they would say another one. What word cloud do you feel more drawn towards? So weekend, home, happy in this particular thing here, universe, music, dream, uh, you know, writing, that kind of stuff, right? So which is more you? That'd be another example of a question they do. So people say they answer these questions, and they self-classify themselves into a category that looks like this. This is an openness scale. If you both picked Frank Sinatra and you went with home, sorry, if you picked Tom Cruise and you went with home uh, weekend and happy, you're more traditional. If you're Frank Sinatra and universe music dream, you're more liberal and artistic. That way your thing is. So a colleague of mine at Cambridge, David Stilwell, set up something called a My Personality app in 2007. This was the first app which was launched on uh, basically Facebook. This was the precursor to Cambridge Analytica and all these problems. Right? That was one of David Shilwell's colleagues. Um, yeah, the Cambridge name has a lot to be, you know, uh, well, people have a lot to blame Cambridge about. But nothing to do with the university, right? It's just the name. 
Okay, so what he did was pretty straightforward. In 2007, you could download this app and answer a bunch of questions exactly like the questions they just talked about, and would it tell you your personality? And the personalities were pretty standard personality tests. They had the Myers-Briggs personality test, for example. Some of you may have taken that already, right? It tells you where you are on a five-scale module, and does all that thing. So at the end of the day, it would tell you, this is your personality, go for it, right? Fine. People love this. People love knowing what they're like, right? So all of us, we get personality tests. We answer it as quickly as we can to try to figure out what it is. I mean, we read horoscopes. We, do, we are very good at trying to figure out what we are like, OK? So what he then did, for example, was go and, first he got everybody classified in the personality types. Then he got permission to, from Facebook to say, if you've answered that personality, let me see what you're putting in your comment section of your Facebook page. So in other words, if you, so now I know what personality type you are. I know what comments you're putting on. Can I predict now your personality based on the comments on your Facebook page? That's all. The number of likes, the number of dislikes, and what you write. So if you're highly extroverted, for example, these are the kind of words you'd use. Right? Party, can't wait, um, you know. And they, uh, these people, extroverts, have a tendency to elongate their vowels. So like, I missed you guys so much, and things like that. Right? So it's a highly extroverted personality. An introverted personality, on the other hand, looks like this. Right? So have, they also use elongated vowels, but they have negative elongated vowels. Right? No, damn it, it didn't work. Viruses, internet, anime. So these are the kind of personality types you'd see. What he then did was say, can I predict your personality based on things like this? What did you type on your Facebook page? This is what he ends up with. Turns out, this is the five trait average. These are the five traits, openness, agreeableness, extraversion, conscientiousness, and neuroticism. And this red line is what we're looking at. Your work colleague is about 20, about 0.27% of the time your, uh, sorry, 27% of the time, your work colleague can predict what type of person you are. That's not very good, right? 27%. You can do it better with a coin toss. Uh, your friend or your, someone who stays in the same place as you has about a 45% chance of guessing your personality. Your family has about a 50% chance of getting your personality. Facebook is about 58%, uh, 56%. Only your spouse is higher at 58%. It turns out Facebook knows you better than your own mother. So this is um, a pretty dramatic result, right? It's basically saying the amount of stuff we reveal about ourselves is telling the whole world um, about what type of people we are. And presumably, this is allowing computers to be able to predict what type of people we are and what, type, what we would want. So I don't need to actually go in there and ask you what you want, because I know what you want. So I'll just suggest something to you. Go ahead and buy it. You should be totally confident about it. Okay? So let's take a practical example about this. This is a company called Tala, which is based in Kenya, and it does things like this. Right? So you can apply for a loan anywhere, anytime, and it is on a phone that looks like this. So you apply for a loan, and what do you think the signals it is that this is looking for? Everything is online, right? So it's on, on your phone. So what kind of signals would you look for to say, the key thing which Tala wants to know is, will you pay back your money? Right? Because I'm lending you money. Will you pay back your money? But I'm doing this in a country like Kenya, where there are no credit history, there are no credit registers, there's no way of telling even whether you are, you know, who you are. All I know is you're applying on a phone. And I have to make up my mind in three seconds. You apply for a loan three seconds later, because the average person would get bored if you would do more than three seconds on your phone. Right? What, what's I'm waiting for? Go to something else. So the classic story which Shivani Surya gives, uh, she has a TED talk, which is quite good. Um, <clears throat> she gave a, gives a story about the World Cup. The last World Cup had, um, you know, these guys, what they do is this guy had the only TV in the entire village. And World Cup's on, so everybody comes to his house to watch TV. The thing, of course, is, you know, this is Kenya, like India, you charge everybody for the privilege of coming to your house to watch TV. Unfortunately, 
The guy hasn't paid his electricity bill, so they cut off his electricity right in the middle of the match. So this guy apparently pulls out his phone and applies for a loan. Tala has to give, decide whether to give him the loan in three seconds. He gets the loan from Tala, uses that to pay for his electricity bill. They turn his electricity on right away, because all of this is electronic. Right. They turn his electricity on, they continue watching the game, and after the game is over, he collects the money from everybody over there who has watched the game with him, and then he pays the loan back. The whole loan is less than 90 minutes long, taking an approval process of three seconds. Right? So you can imagine any bank in the world being able to do something like this, almost impossible. So the question, of course, is what kind of signals does Tala look for? Right? So this is what it would be. Thing. Some of the things are interesting here. This is something called your status on Tala. So you have paid back five loans already. That means your status is now gold. You'll be able to get a next loan faster. So whenever you pay back a loan, that increases your status. But what's also interesting, you can't read this very clearly here, but it basically says if you keep your app on all the time, it will help you get faster access to these gold status numbers you need to get a better loan. So why should you keep your phone on all the time? It turns out because there's a lot of information being generated by it. If your phone calls last more than four minutes, you tend to have stronger relationships. That's one of the things that Tala looks for. If, you're, if you communicate with more than 58, this is the crucial number, 58 different contacts, you're a better borrower because you have a wider network to depend on. Okay? When you type in your contact list, if you have both a first and a last name, you're 16 times more reliable than very few contacts listed with both first and last names. So for example, if you just say, Badri, for example, yeah, doesn't, you're not going to get a loan. You better have the first name and the last name. And even better, if you capitalize the first letter and capitalize the first letter of the last name. Okay. Similarly, w these guys also have access to the actual, um, they also have access to your bank account. So when you pay for something, when somebody buys something from you, they can see that payment hitting your phone bank account. The moment it hits a bank account, they'll send you an SMS saying, hey, by the way, you owe us some money. You want to pay it back right now? Turns out that more than 80% of those people pay on their phones right away the moment they get that reminder. Why should you send somebody a reminder when you obviously doesn't have the money? Right? More information which you can get. For example, it turns out that your phone is tracking where you are literally all the time. Right? You can look at, you can check your past history on your phone. For the last six months, it will tell you minute by minute where you have been. Right, it's buried deep in your settings for those of you who are interested. So what Tala will find out is, OK, are you staying in the same place between 9 PM and 5 AM every day? Your phone is, not, is motionless somewhere between 9 PM and 5 AM every day. Similarly, between, five, between 9 AM and 5 PM, your phone is not moving from a certain area. What will that tell you? Well, you are a home, you have a home, and you have a job in a fixed area. That makes you a better borrower. If your phone is in a different place every night, you're not going to get a loan from Tala. Right? So all of this is information which is being given to solve those two problems, imperfect information, asymmetric information, and behavioral biases right here. Okay? But the key problem of all these models is they don't really do a good job in predicting emergent behavior. A lot of the stuff we do is not driven by how we behave in isolation. This is all about how we behave in isolation. But we behave the way we do based on the people around us and based on interactions we have with the people around us. And this is also a new area which we don't have much idea about. We can't really talk about it, but it, we see this in all sorts of areas. For example, slime mold behavior. Right? This looks like one giant fungus, but it's actually millions of organisms, all of them which will spontaneously every now and then move away in different directions into the forest. When food gets low, they separate into millions of different organisms. They come together at certain other points. And it's very difficult to predict when this is going to happen. Similarly, ant behavior. It's, well, you heard of the term hive mind. What that means is they seem to work as though they were thinking, living creatures who are not really, none of them are actually choosing what roles they play. They just do it. And it looks like a conscious practical behavior, but it's entirely driven by pheromones. 
The same thing for human beings, and this is a brand new area, so we don't have much idea about how people behave in groups. We have ideas about how they behave individually. So where are we right now? We are basically saying improvements in data ontology is helping us extract valuable data from huge streams of data and categorizing it in many directions. We are talking about advances in matching algorithms which should help us find the optimal transaction partner. And finally, we are saying the machine learning system should be able to identify our preferences so that we don't have to spend time making those preferences explicit. We literally should be able to do everything automatically. It will tell you, you're getting out in the morning, OK, there's a car waiting for you. We know that you like this particular driver. That driver has been ordered. You know, you don't have to spend time doing all this stuff because the system has learned how you like to do things. Now, this all sounds good or bad. It could be you know, depending on what your uh, thoughts are. Maybe you think this is good. Maybe you think this is bad. We come back to that. But let's take, apply all these to the three big areas I'm going to talk about, right? AI, automation, and blockchains. When you think about AI, how does it work? The basic idea is very straightforward. We talked about training data a few seconds ago. So we start with a huge database of digital images with a set of labels that tell us things, like this is a dog, that's a cat, beach, mountain, whatever. Then the goal is to use that data to train a computer how to predict labels for a new set of things. So, and you can go to a website like cloudgoogle.com vision to see examples of all the different types of training databases there are. The classic approach was to create a set of rules that identify pixels in the image and try to come up with what the image is supposed to be. Not very good, doesn't work. The latest system basically looks at layered neural networks where we'll talk about the advantages of layered neural networks and the disadvantages there are. The layered neural network, the idea is very straightforward. You have an image of some huge number of training data sets over there, right? different animals labeled. You have an input, which is a dog. This one has to tell you that it's a dog with 80% probability and maybe a 10% probability of a wolf or something else. How does it do it? Well, layers. So the first layer will just look at the edges. Second layer will put the edges together and say, that's the nose, that's the tail, and so on. Third layer puts all of it together, so it passes layer by layer through a different one, uh, a, a different set, each layer feeding the next layer. This is straightforward, and the reason it's working so much is because the amount of computing power being thrown at this and the amount of data available has grown dramatically. For example, the Open Images has a 9.5 million data set of labeled images. Um, the Stanford dog data set, if you're just looking at dogs, has 20,000 images of 120 different breeds of dogs. Big data sets. You also have very popular open source packages which allow you to copy all these things very straightforwardly. And finally, you have a huge bunch of hardware which allows you to do that as well. And you don't have to buy them. You're available via cloud computing providers. Right? So all this stuff is available for you. So, but that's the big picture. Right? Let's go a little deeper. So we talk about deep learning. So the basic, there are four basic stories here. There are actually a whole bunch of other ones. So um, the ones I'm not going to talk about because that's not really AI. This is more what I call AI. Right? So there are basic neural networks, uh, GNs, con uh, convolutional networks, and recurrent neural nets. And I'll focus a little more on recurrent neural nets to explain what I mean. So let's take Gmail. When we are typing stuff into Gmail now, you must have noticed that Gmail completes your sentences, right? So what do most of us do? Usually we read that sentence and you're like, mm, yeah, not quite what I wanted to say, but it's pretty close. So you press tab, sentence is completed, you move on, right? Happens all the time. The question is, how does uh, Gmail predict what you're going to be saying, right? The way it works is very straightforward. It's taking a huge amount of source text and tries to see what words come right next to each other. So this is a quick brown fox jumped over the lazy dog. The V is right next to quick, and maybe it's reasonably close to brown. And similarly, quick is right next to the, and so on. So basically, it looks for what words are close together. So next step, it runs it through this. So when you come up with the word Soviet, you're unlikely to be saying elephant. Because there are very few examples in the text of Soviet elephant, but many examples of Soviet Union, so it predicts you're going to say Union. 
So what's the network, what's the strategy for that? It's called a recurrent neural network. And the way it works is the networks with loops in them along that information to persist over time. So in other words, you have the letter word coming in here. It keeps holding that in memory till it figures out what the question is. This, unfortunately, works for easy examples, but it stops working once you get to more complex examples, which human beings can solve very easily. So take an example. Let's suppose I say the clouds are in the, what do you think? Sky, right? I mean, that's not really super difficult over here. Fine. But let's take another one. I grew up in France in a little village south of the River Seine. My parents had a small summer house there. I spent time eating um, frog's legs with my grandmother every day. I speak fluent. For human beings, this isn't e e difficult at all, right? Because we're constructing a story in our heads as we go along about what this person's life is like. But computers don't know the world. What they are doing is keeping that word, every word, in its memory till it and keep looping back until they get to a thing. OK, that's a country. Let's get that word over there. That gets really difficult the longer the phrase is. It's very difficult for a computer to predict French, but very easy for a human being to predict French. Right? So these are the problems there. And there are other examples. For example, what's the difference between these two images? Most of the time, I'm, I'll, I'll tell you what it is, it's this image over here, which is not in this one here. What's that image? That's actually an elephant. The people who came up with this call this the elephant in the room. Right? The elephant in the room, is that's OK. Right? The elephant is fine. The key problem is, if you look at the other things in the room. So remember, what I was talking about was recurrent neural networks. So they're checking the probability of everything with everything else. So everything is linked. So, what we would do, if a human being was looking at these two pictures, we'd say, OK, that's anomalous. Oh, I don't know what it is. Maybe it kind of looks weird. OK, that's an elephant. Someone's pasted an elephant in there. Easy for us to do, because we can analyze that and say that jumps out of place. What the computer does is over here, you have a chair with 83% accuracy. The moment you put the elephant in the room, the chair becomes a couch with 57% accuracy. So, it misclassifies something else in the room because of the presence of something else there because everything shifts, all the patterns shift. There's a cup over here with 50% accuracy. The cup disappears. The computer can no longer see that cup. There is um, a laptop here with 33%. That stays the same, but it misses the handbag with over here that probability changes again. So in other words, what's happening here is think about an autonomous car. You're driving, you're sitting in the car, the car's driving along, and suddenly it sees a turkey crossing the side of the road and misses, because of that, reevaluates the probability of everything in front of it and misses the pedestrian right in front. Right? That's going to be a problem. Right? This is the big problem with this, and there's a whole bunch of people who spend their lives breaking AI systems. That's the area of adversarial AI. Right? And I'll give you an example here. This is a panda. You put that on top, we get this image. We think, there's no difference between this image and this image. But the computer will identify that as a given with 99% probability. Or let's take another example. This is the original image from the data set. That's a clean image. You add some noise to it, the computer will tell you with, um, this one says washer with 53% probability. This one says it's a washer with 22% probability and a safe with 34% probability. This one is a safe with 37% probability and a loudspeaker with 24% probability. And so computers have enormous difficulties with these kind of problems. So, and then of course, this has created a lot of additional problems as well. For example, you all heard of Tay, right? Microsoft chatbot system. So this was introduced by Microsoft to answer chats and group me and kick, and it was designed to personalize the interaction with the users. And the users found that this K would use a, a big pool to try to analyze what to say back. So the pool consists of racist tweets. That's all it would be able to pull out and give back here. Within two days, it was saying that Hitler is a wonderful person. It was saying there's no way the Holocaust happened. And it said, Trump, amazing. That president, one of my best presidents in America. And Microsoft pulled it after two days. 
OK, Facebook did something similar. They wanted chatbots to talk to each other so that, in other words, if you tell a friend, hey, you know what, I'm going to, I, that, there's a beautiful picture of Mauritius that Facebook would suddenly pop up and message saying, hey, I know that you want to go to Mauritius. Here's a really cheap ticket I found. Right? So something like that. The idea that you know, it sounds creepy to me, but you know, Facebook thinks maybe it's a good way to make money from people. Not a problem. Except it turns out that the chatbot started figuring out that English is not really a good way to communicate. So they started changing the language to come up with their own. Instead of saying, I don't want to care about the books. I just want the balls. The chatbot would say something like, balls have zero to me, to me, to me, to me, to me. They you know, emphasize exactly how much it did not want the balls compared to this one over here. Another example was, of course, the target pregnancy case. This is a very famous case about maybe about 10 years ago. Right? Some of you have done this already. So all of you? Yeah? OK. For those of you who haven't, it was a very straightforward uh, thing. Target's problem was is trying to figure out how would you persuade people to shop at their grocery stores. Now, this is really difficult to do, right? Because most of us are creatures of habit. How many of us change the supermarket we go to every day? Not many hands, right? How many of us change every month? Not that many hands either. We're pretty much creatures of habit. We go in the supermarket. We know where stuff is. We don't even have to think about it. There's the milk. There's you know, the peanuts, whatever. You just grab it, put it in your basket, and walk on. Right? So target figures, the only way I can get people to change is to get them when they're doing something new which they've never done before. What's that thing which is new? When you're pregnant for the first time. So if you're pregnant for the first time, you're doing something you've never done before, if I can persuade you to start shopping at Target, you become a loyal customer for life. Right? That's the idea. So it spent an enormous amount of time and money trying to predict when um, women were going to become pregnant, so it's to persuade them to jump and join Target precisely at that time. So the story goes that um, this um, father walks into, this, um, walks into the store uh, and you know, calls the assistant manager and starts screaming at him. He says, what the hell are you doing? My daughter is 16 years old. You sent her pamphlets about you know, pregnancy-related items. What are you thinking? And the manager is sorry. He says, oh, I'm so sorry. I don't know how this happened. I apologize. Here's a $100 coupon. You know, we, please, uh, I, I apologize profusely. So next week, the guy's back in the shop, and the manager sees him again and says, I hope everything is OK. I'm so sorry about what happened last week. You know? And the guy says, well, actually, I should be apologizing to you because uh, there were some things at home which were happening which I didn't know about. So yeah, I'm sorry about that. Right? So, but now, of course, Target does a better job about this because what it does is manipulates the junk mail you get. So when you get your junk mail, you don't want only baby-related ads because that sounds really creepy. Right? So what they do is put in a bunch of things they know you're never going to buy, chainsaws or snow tires. But the proportion of baby-related items is higher in your junk mail than your neighbor's junk mail. How many of us go to our neighbor and say, hey, let me see your junk mail? Huh, your junk mail is different from my junk mail. Right? We don't normally do that. That's what Target's depending on. Right? Or my favorite example is Google Photos, who mistook black people to be gorillas. So it would basically, you put a picture of your friend up there, Google Photos would classify this as a gorilla picture. Now, why did this happen? The answer was obvious, the training data set. The training data set was taken from a huge bunch of photos uploaded by mostly Google employees. Who is a typical Google employee? Well, there were a lot of Indians. There were lots of Chinese. There were lots of white people. There were very, very few black people. So when the training data set doesn't have any pictures of black people, and Google, somebody comes up, well, I don't have anything in this. I don't know what it is. It identifies it as a gorilla. So how did Google solve this problem? No problem. It just basically got rid of the word completely. It was um, Google's workforce only 2.5 percent blank uh, is only 2.5 percent blank. Instead of figuring out a solution, it simply removed the ability to search for gorillas on Google Photos. Now you cannot. You try to hunt for gorillas on your photos. You will not. Google Photos will not pull it out for you. Because there's no way they can't figure out how to solve this gorilla problem. Okay. So what have you achieved in AI? You've got excellent rebranding. In 1987, when I was here, we talk about data. We talk about 
Maybe you talk about neural networks. Now we talk about big data. It's the same thing. Data is data, right? We talk, but big data sounds a lot nicer than just data. We talk about deep learning systems. But we also know that going from narrow tasks to general stuff is much harder than we think. So for example, Watson beat human contestants on Jeopardy, but made a number of incorrect diagnoses for cancer. We had the AlphaGo program for DeepMind, which beat humans at Go. They used it in the UK for the National Health Service to reduce costs in 2015. That wasn't particularly groundbreaking. It was just a fancy decision tree. There was really no AI in that. So what's it good for? At the moment, we can try to find patterns in data. The problem, of course, is you need that well-structured data, data with classifications and well-defined endpoints. And that's missing in a lot of things we throw AI at. So this is something we need to keep in mind. Automation. Same question here with our databases, again, are crucial in realizing when can human beings be replaced with automation. So for example, if you think about markets, you have lots of data to train the AI systems. In firms, executives have this wide variety of decisions, and we don't necessarily have enough data. Right? The, if you have a similar type of decisions, they're very few. So, you know, you need more data for the systems to work when you don't have that within a firm. So very difficult to imagine that high-level managers are going to be replaced with automation very soon. That's good news for everybody in this room. Right? So in industries, if you take the finance industry alone, the general accounting operations, that's pretty routine, lots of easy examples, and you do not change your accounting procedures from one uh, from one company to another. It stays exactly the same. So for those of you interested in specializing in accounting, there's a high chance that your job is going to be automated in the next few years. So maybe you want to switch away from that. Right? The biggest areas where you, which should not be automated are areas like business development, external relationships, auditing, risk management, and so on, where the data sets are not big enough to replace humans yet. So. What kind of manager will not be replaced? With lots of informal and social information. So, you know, drinks after work. So you go down to Balekahali, have a drink, that kind of stuff. Yeah, that's the kind of stuff we used to do too. That's the kind of, this is very important because we were telling ourselves, this is why we are not going to be replaced in the future, all the drinks we're having in the pubs. Right? Okay, if you have different organizational units, multiple organizational units, you have complex situations, not just within your own unit, but stuff which is changing the behavior of a different unit. That's difficult to do because there are very few examples of data sets with cross-organizational uh, unit uh, decision making. So in other words, the ideal types of managers were those with T-shapes, skill sets, right? You know your area, but you also know a huge number of different areas. So it's good to be a generalist more than a specialist these days. Right? Specialists, the problem you run into is that if there's a lot of data about you, it's likely to be, you're likely to be replaced much faster. Last bit, blockchains. These are very trendy these days. Everybody talks about blockchain. Right? We have all these stories. Calistone switches mutual funds to blockchain, a uh, new blockchain platform, and you know, blockchains everywhere. Right? So the question is, do we really need this blockchain? That's something we haven't really talked about very much. Right? It's very trendy. OK, so we have a huge number of definitions. right? So, but the key takeaway is very straightforward. The only three situations where you might think about having a blockchain. One is users want to be anonymous. So you need some kind of cryptography to protect the anonymity. Second thing, the data is unstructured. So very big pieces of data, very small pieces of data, not a problem because you use hashes to control everything to bring it down to one fixed length. And finally, the data cannot be edited. So that's, you need to be able to use proof of work or proof of stake or some other method to actually make sure that no one can alter the data. Those are the three cases when you might want to have a blockchain. Right? So, uh, <clears throat> At its core, it's basically a chain of blocks. Right? What does that mean, essentially? It's a ledger entry, like an accounting. You've got an origination, a destination, and a transaction detail. So for example, if you have Mr. Black transferring five bitcoins to Ms. Green, that's a ledger entry. OK, so the problem is, number one, maybe your bank manager, who actually keeps the records, diverts the money to her own account. So instead of going to Ms. Green, she puts her own name there and diverts the money over there. 
Second possibility, maybe Mr. Black is overspending. He doesn't have the money. He's still trying to spend it. Third possibility, maybe he <clears throat> does, pay, does have the money, but the moment he pays it, he goes and buys another coffee uh, with the same amount of money. So he spends the money twice instead of once. So, or maybe he doesn't want anyone or even his bank manager to know he needed to send funds to Mr. Green. Private transaction, why should everybody find out? These are all the different problems where you might see, I need a blockchain. So the key idea about a blockchain is no one has control of the ledger, so you can't divert the money. Uh, no one can falsify anything on the blockchain, and you can't spend the same money twice, and everybody's identity can be kept completely secret. Right? I'm not going to get into the details of it. So these are the three problems we need to solve, and the three technologies we have are cryptography, hashing, and mining to solve exactly these three problems. If you don't have these, you don't need blockchains. A centrally managed database works perfectly OK. Right? It's only in these three situations that you might want to think about having a blockchain. So in a private blockchain, in a permission blockchain, in other words, there's no need for miners, but you need to sign a transaction. So really, is this worth it? In many cases, the answer is no. But most companies don't know. Right? They, it sounds trendy. It sounds cool. It's much better to tell your investors you're actually doing something with a blockchain than to say, I'm using a centralized database with a standard relational features. Right? That, that's common sense. And everybody will say, yeah, that's, that's not cool. They won't hire people to work at them unless they say you're doing something cool. So one area where I think it's particularly interesting is the area of smart contracts. So the, the thing with contracts is, if you want the contract to be enforced, you need a lawyer. An unfortunate problem with lawyers is they're expensive. You need to pay them. Right? So what you want to do is to have a contract which is written and executed without a lawyer ever being present. So you have a tiny transaction, and it works, should work perfectly. So let's take an example. <clears throat> so it's a derivative contract. For example, pay 1,000 rupees to Badri if the LIBOR is above 2% on the 10th of January 2019. Right? Pretty straightforward. It's an option contract. The value is checked automatically by the contract. Money is transferred. I don't need a lawyer sitting in between to transfer the money back and forth. Okay? So this is an example of a company which is actually doing something like this called BitRent. So BitRent depends on the Internet of Things. So what it does is once you have a, you're trying to build a house, but the problem with building a house is your contractor is doing a bunch of stuff to say, oh, the stuff didn't arrive on time, the boiler didn't arrive, I ordered it, or the price went up, and all these things. Here what you're doing is when you're buying all the construction material, they already have sensors built in. So the idea is the moment the boiler is in place, the boiler hooks up to the net around you and says, hey, I'm online. OK, the money is automatically transferred to the contractor for having fulfilled that activity on the day specified. Two days late? The money is cut automatically. It, it's done by the system. So you don't need to sit, stand at the construction site with your contractor every day. This is done automatically by the system. And it can get better. For example, imagine going to the bathroom at 3 o'clock in the morning. Right? You switch on the light. Your light bulb is connected to the internet. Checks all the local electricity companies, which is the electricity company which is giving me the electricity at the lowest price at 3 o'clock in the morning. Writes a contract. You finish your business three minutes later, switch off the light, contract is over, money is automatically paid for your account. You, why do you need to have a 24 by 7 electricity connection? You only need it at the point in time when you actually switch on the electric switch. right? So that's the idea here. And of course, the negatives. This is the DAO, the Digital Autonomous Organization. One of the most famous examples of a smart contract going wrong. So what happened here? was this was a bunch of contracts written on the blockchain. And there was a bunch of, it was a venture capital firm. So the venture capital firm would be, you buy stuff with Ether, you buy DO tokens with Ether, and you vote on decisions on allocating resources on the blockchain. So it was owned by everybody. On top of the structure, a group of curators. And the curator's job was to say, OK, this is, they were elected. They would be in charge of actually allocating the tokens. So, Incredibly popular. It was launched on the 30th of April, 2016. Very popular. It raised $100 million by the 15th of May, 15 days later. By the end of uh, June, middle of June, it had raised $150 million for more 11,000 people. 
right, a venture capital fund which had raised $150 million in a period of six weeks. Unfortunately, during the crowd sale, several people said the code is vulnerable to an attack, and so we'll figure this out later. So these guys said there's a recursive call bug, but no funds were at risk on the 12th of June. By the 17th of June, somebody started draining the DAO of Ether collected the soil of it from the sales of his tokens. What did it do? Well, what he did was there's a programming mistake which said that as a shareholder, I can create a second fund, a child fund, without getting permission from all the other shareholders. So it, he started taking the money out of the, from the main fund to the child fund, and then from the child fund, he could take it to his, himself because he was the sole shareholder of the child fund. Unfortunately, there's a 28-day gap. You couldn't touch your fund for 28 days. So money left the big fund, went to the small fund, but he couldn't take it out of the small fund. Right? So that was about $60 million in Ether were taken out of the original fund into the clone. So these guys immediately stopped it. They said, OK, we're going to do a soft fork at that time. But then you know, we need to figure out a way of how to take the system back so that this guy could not have drained the funds to start with. So what was the problem there? The problem was, of course, as the guy pointed out, this was the letter the guy wrote. Can, how does this come up? This, um, is there a way to show the letter itself? <coughs> is there a way to show that letter? Okay, so I'll need you for a second. I'll, I'll go back after this letter. The letter basically said, this is to the DAO and the Ethereum community. I've carefully examined the code of the DAO and decided to participate after finding the feature was putting as reward with additional ether. I have made use of this feature and would like to thank the DAO for the reward. I'm disappointed by those characterizing the use of this intentional feature as theft. My law firm has advised me my action is fully compliant with United States criminal and tort law. And he said, these are the terms and conditions. And if you do anything, you take my money away. That you are breaking the rules of the contract. Right? And a lot of people said, yes, that's right. We made a mistake in the writing the original code of the contract. This guy has taken advantage of a hole in the code. It's his money now. But a lot of other people said, hold on. That's 60 million bucks. That's a lot of money. So eventually, they decided to do a hard fork, which rolled back the transactions all the way to before the guy stole it. Unfortunately, that means that anybody who did a transaction after that time, whether it benefited him or not, was also wiped out because you know, the transaction didn't happen. So the whole idea about a blockchain being completely immutable and non-falsifiable was invalidated by the fact that with a lot of money is at stake, pretty much everybody said, OK, let's roll back uh, the stuff to the thing here. All right. So coming back to this thing here. <coughs> How, last part, how does blockchain change the future, though? Think about incorporating a firm without stock whatsoever. Examples, right? Ether, Ether for example. Ethereum raised funds for a public crowd sale, blacks a free-floating token, and operates it as a nonprofit organization in Switzerland. But the people are all over the place. For example, Vitaly Buterin stays in San Francisco in a place um, close to uh, North Beach. So here... What is it that, who are the owners of the corporation? When you say maximize shareholder value, where are the shareholders in this kind of corporation here? It's even paying money directly through uh, a particular uh, form of token, not in the form of dollars or any other type of currency. Similarly, you don't know who your employees. So how might you do that? Right? So, for example, the, uh, a website called Mimblewimble, where the developers use Harry Potter characters as names. So how do you know who's senior or who's junior? I mean, when you think about a hierarchical organization, you say, this person has the decision rights. Who is that person? We don't even know who they are. Which part of the world do they come from? I have no clue in many of the cases here, right? So this changes it. All our norms, like decision making based on seniority, other internal politics may not be intuitive. And the rules may be written into software rather than ingrained into their culture. Can you operate without any assets? Yes, for example, Filecoin and Golem 
have peer-to-peer -peer network lends out your, comp your computing hardware. So if you have a computer, you're not really using it, you can earn Filecoin by offering anyone in the world the ability to store stuff on your hard disk. We already do that when we think of uh, torrent websites, right? So if you're, you ever use a torrent thing to download a movie, that's pretty much what you're doing, right? For exactly the same idea here. Similarly, Helium is providing wireless coverage, so you buy a wireless router, you keep it plugged in, let your neighbors hop onto that, you earn basically uh, helium coins with that. And so you don't actually need mobile towers, you have people piggybacking across the world on those kind of towers. So overall, finally, this is the kind of stuff we are doing, it's being pretty influential. The Financial Conduct Authority in the UK, this is one of my favorite headlines, asked us to help them figure out what the regulation should be of this sector. So that's our website, which I said in the beginning. Welcome to go to this website. It talks about all the stuff we've been talking about today. We have a whole bunch of reports which are published, and you're welcome to um, download that data um, and use it in any way. If you have any questions, just feel free to contact me at any time. Okay. So overall conclusions, technology is changing the way we coordinate. Those boundaries between markets and firms are moving. The major developments should keep track of new ontologies to classify our data, development of techniques to model the different preferences we have, and automation, AI, and blockchain. They are trying to predict preferences from human beings. We don't have any theory about them at the moment. AI models, second order threats, I don't really believe that's going to really have a huge effect in the next five to 10 years. Blockchains and distributed ledger systems may change the way firms are organized. So this is our first order, which you're trying to think about. This is probably uh, further away from actual development at the moment, okay? And that should be it. Do you want a mic? That this might be easier for everybody to hear. I mean, what, what are we thinking about? I mean, conduct risk is such a huge thing, right? So what... Uh, okay, I'll give you an example. I'll give you an example. So, but this question was about the Financial Conduct Authority. What are regulators thinking when they look at these kind of models? Right? One of the things they were worried about, for example, think about peer-to-peer -peer -peer lending models. So peer-to-peer -peer lending model is basically where individuals lend money directly to companies without a bank being involved. The point is the peer-to-peer -peer lending platform needs liquidity. Without liquidity, without a number of people giving money, you don't have that deep pool of money which can be matched with borrowers and lenders. So what they're doing is trying to attract institutional, shareholders, institutional lenders as well. So how do you attract an institutional lender? You might tell the institutional lender, look, we'll give you the cream of the loans ahead of everybody else and then open up the dregs to the common people. So the FCA wants to make sure that's not what's happening. That means, in other words, there's no adverse selection in the pool which is happening. One in the back over there. There's some right there in the middle. Okay, it's it might be easier for everybody else though. Just, uh... <coughs> so, sir, uh, my question is that AI is basically a learning technology. It learns from whatever data there's back there. Um, but we have seen, and history is an example of that, that each and every event that happens in the financial markets in the coming future, they are, they are unique in their own sense. There's no learning for that. So is it possible that in the near future we'll be able to predict recessions or probably using AI? Uh, I'm sorry, is it possible to predict? predict next recession probably or a downturn in the market using AI. Yeah, this goes back to the point I was talking about earlier emergent behavior, right? So the moment you talk about macroeconomic stuff, um, it's almost it's very difficult to do. I, it's easier for me to predict who you are as a human being, as an individual, because you're answering a bunch of questions, and it's, but it's very difficult to actually predict how people behave in groups. So the micro level is pretty good when we talk about these kind of psychometric models and things like that. Going from the micro to the macro, Nobody has done it yet, 
right? It's almost impossible to do it. And turning points are even worse because what changes the behavior of one group of people suddenly to switch? Like think of the markets over the last week or so or from August, right? Till August, the markets were all going upward. What suddenly triggered from August all the way down to December? What triggered the upswing in the last few days of December? I, nobody has any clue, right? So this is a big, a very fundamental area of, um, of research which there are no answers. So very good topic for companies, and companies are really worried about predicting precisely that. Okay, so a great question. <coughs> Thank you for that wonderful, wonderful and comprehensive talk that you delivered. Um, very many aspects. Um, I had a question uh, based on behavior once again. Now, let's say we say that there are uh, banks that lend farmers on smart, <coughs> sm uh, smart contract basis. And the farmers have to take their loan and have to purpose that for the purpose that they have taken the loan for, no marrying their children off and all that. Uh, when such things are enforced, do you see that the whole thing will collapse? Because then they will simply have to farm, no more marriages to conduct. And uh, pretty much every other application of it. What's going to happen to finance? This is also a very important um, uh, social problem these days, right? Because one of, the things, one of the things I've been talking about is using technology to predict how human beings are. And uh, I did not talk about this in my talk, but one of the countries where this is really being applied is China. Right? So the, China, the Chinese social credit system is based entirely on the thing that we can predict what kind of person you are based on your characteristics. So not talking about farmers, but this is about everybody in China. So it's like an Aadhaar card, but in this particular case, this number will tell you how much, what loan you're going to get, what rate you're going to get on that loan. And it depends on several factors. For example, um, it depends on your education level. It depends on where you live. But it also depends on what you buy. So if you buy video games, your social credit score goes down. If you buy nappies for your children, your social credit score goes up because you're a responsible parent. It also depends on how much you're actually spending time um, with your friends. If your friends criticize the Communist Party, your score goes down. If your friends praise the Communist Party, your score goes up. So you're constantly trying to look at each other and saying, should I be friends with this person? He's a real loser. If I'm friends with him, my score goes down. Right? So these are things not under your control. And if you have a smart contract, which is trying to go back and look at a farmer and say, is that farmer going to deliver? Is that farmer actually going to do stuff according to this? At the end of the day, you're you're trying to draw too much information about something where there's no theory. And this is a, this is a huge problem, and, uh, but a number of countries are going ahead with it without even thinking about the various issues which are, which are occurring right now. So ethics, morality, um, all of this is, if you take quantitative numbers, you're not taking the human factor into account. One more hand there. Thank you. Um, my question is most on the regulatory aspect in terms of if you have, take smart contracts for instance, um, how is the world responding in terms of smart contracts being used more? Because the deal with contracts is you have you have disputes and uh, to resolve as, and I mean, sure, that can be adjusted in terms of code and all of that, that's fine. But in terms of allowing smart contracts to take over, say, for equity sales or like IPOs, uh, where, where does the world stand in terms of viewing that as a, is that, do they see that as a positive um, movement or are, uh, or are like central banks resisting it, like exchange boards resisting it at that point and like, is that gonna change going forward? Mm -hmm. So that's a very good question. Um, the answer is regulators usually don't have much of a clue either. Right? So one of the things um, we are developing at the, um, at the center is basically a regulatory, kind of a regulatory education um, network where we're trying to persuade regulators to say, what are the issues you guys should be studying? So we are entering into a project with the OECD, uh, which is precisely about educating regulators about these issues. But at the end of the day, 
the thing is the technology is changing so fast that think about smart contracts itself, changing the way the organizations are founded. Um, five years ago, none of these issues would exist, right? ICOs did not exist three years ago. And today, nobody does an ICO anymore. So again, the question becomes, should the regulator actually worry about these issues? Should it wait for a little period of time? We don't know the answers to any of these questions. Right? And even ICOs, cryptocurrencies, blockchains, we don't know what the right way to regulate any of these things is. So these are all interesting issues um, and um, fascinating to study, but I don't know the answers. Uh, hello, sir. My name is Murli. So any uh, inputs about the impact of technology on the platform cooperative? If you are aware about the platform cooperative, uh, there are like alternate technologies uh, that are being uh, emerging in Europe as an alternate to Uber, all these things because they feel that uh, one company is monopolizing the whole customer segment as well as the taxi segment. Uh, <coughs> so how is this kind of income, uh, technology input or whatever, do you see that as a thing that is going to come? Um, that's also an excellent question. Um, one of the things that's happening in, um, around the world, the technology firm, is that the advantage they have is the huge volumes of data that they have, right? And I think uh, Luigi Zingales talked about this last week. There are three problems which you have. Problem one is economies of scale, but that's relatively small. The second problem is that of network effects. I want to be on Facebook because all my friends are on Facebook. But the last problem is called feedback effects. Luigi didn't touch about feedback effects. But feedback effects is what, what creates a crucial advantage for most of these companies. So when you type, when you correct something in Gmail, you're not just correcting your own email, you're correcting everybody's email around the world. So take an example. When you, for example, um, do the CAPTCHA system, so you're logging into some bank account, and it says, identify all the pictures with bridges, right? You're not just identifying pictures of bridges as a security thing. You're helping the system understand what pictures of bridges are. As an ex if you want to try that, by the way, just misidentify a few. You will still get into the system. Right? It, the system doesn't know that you're lying or telling the truth. I always misidentify at least two pictures, but I, I get into my bank account anyway. Right? So at the end of the day, the key question is more about how do you get that sheer volume of data advantage that technology companies have and give it to so that innovation is elsewhere in the world. That was Luigi's problem as well. And I think one of the ways you can do it would be a tax on the amount of data which you, um, which you have. So for example, if you have 80% of the market, you may have to anonymize 80% of your data and make it available to anybody. If you have 20% of the market, 20% of your data should be available to anybody. So if other people can use that same data to develop innovative models, maybe that's an answer. I don't know. Right? But at the moment, the, uh, the, uh, the big five are really strong in the monopoly powers almost. <coughs> one last one. Okay, let's do that as the last one. I think people are getting uh, ready to go to the new US parties. Hello, Professor. Uh, so, uh, how do you see the growth of peer to peer industry in comparison to banking? With Zopa, the UK peer to peer platform getting the banking license. So, is this something like the future of banking? Like, so what's your take on it? Yeah, so um, there are peer-to-peer -peer platforms. Uh, uh, there are a lot of fintech companies which are going, they're becoming much more traditional now, right? So Zopa, as you point out, is a classic example. Um, there are other companies in the, U in the U.S. which are seeking banking licenses as well. Um, <clears throat> the question is, again, how do the regulators treat this? Because one of the big problems, especially in the U.S., is most of these are classified under shadow banks. So in the shadow banks are not really classified. So Quicken Loans, for example, is a massive giver, uh, distributor of mortgage loans to the American public, but it's not regulated by anybody. Right? So uh, the, will they come into the no <clears throat> normal financial system? I don't know. Right? It depends on the regulators. But the key is, at the end of the day, the question for the peer-to-peer -peer lending platform is, my current business model is not generating enough money. So maybe the way to do it is to break into the normal financial system so they become more like the traditional banks. The advantage is they never started with the bank branches and so on, so the costs are much lower. So maybe that gives them a permanent advantage. I don't know. Okay. Okay, I guess. Uh, Thank you very much. And for everybody else here, 
Thank you for coming on the last day of the year. So a very happy new year to all of you.